Welcome back uh, to Spirit of Faith, uh, second hour for th Thursday. And we're going to continue talking about confession. I know towards the end, <laughs> I tried to wrap up the last, the last type of confession, which is holding fast to a confession of faith, be, holding fast to speaking what God says and, and saying what God says about you. Okay, so let's, let's look at Hebrews 4. Because ultimately, like we're going to talk about Abraham today, you know, and Abraham began to say what God said. Okay, it took a while, but then he began to say, and the Lord even changed his name, you know, changed his name so that his name would represent God's vision of what was ahead, that he would be the father of many nations. Amen. So Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, and we're just working through um, Hebrews 11, the different ones that are in the hall of fame of faith. Uh, 14, uh, this is Hebrews 4.14. It says, seeing then we have a great high priest which has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Thank you, Lord. Let us hold fast our profession or confession. Let us say the same things. Let's stay with it. You know, let's stay with what he says about us. Amen. For we we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmity, but in all points was tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in this time of need. Amen. Hallelujah. So, Father, we thank you for today that you establish us in that which belongs to us. Father, nothing will establish us as quickly and build our faith as quickly as confession. Lord, we ask that you'll give us a revelation of what we should be saying over every circumstance and every every moment of our lives, that we would say what you say. We would side in with you. And simply what faith is, is agreeing with you, Lord, and giving you permission, not limiting your plans through unbelief and doubt, but embracing the impossible and scaling the mountains of possibilities in God. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Father, that you have given us the spirit of a pioneer, someone who will go where others won't go. We'll take the high road. Amen. Hallelujah. And Father, thank you that this is a group, this is a, a school that is established in faith. They're established in love. They're established in the leading of the Holy Spirit, Father, and that you will do great things with them. You'll move them up and, and show them the mighty things that your hand can do in the earth. Father, thank you that these are leaders future leaders of the church in this nation, Father, and they're being prepared for that which you have prepared for them. So, Father, thank you for establishing us through our confession, through our agreement that we say what you say and we do what you do, and we are well-pleasing in your sight. We thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hallelujah. So we have to have a, a bold confession. Um, you know, Brother Hagen used to tell us, you can school yourself into faith. Well, you school yourself into faith by saying the same things that God says. You know, you, you, you repeat the word back to him. You know, you hold up the book and say, God, you said it. You said it. And God says, I'm not a man that I should lie. Have I not said it? Will I not do it? So we're siding in with God where, and we enter into rest. We enter into a place of peace because we know who we have believed. Amen. And we're persuaded. We're persuaded. Amen. So our, lo looking at the screen here, our identification with Christ demands an identical confession of, of faith. Amen. Our identification with Christ demands an identical confession of faith. We win the war by saying what God says about every circumstance and every situation. We, we don't cave in to feelings, to pressure, to unbelief, you know, because it's, it's, your faith will be tested, amen? Your faith will be put, uh, I don't want to say put on display, but it, it simply means that your faith, all faith will be tested, okay? When you take a stand, the enemy is going to come and say, oh, you really believe that? You really believe that? Okay, well, let's find out. You know, put a little pressure on you. You know, put a little 
pressure on the senses, what you see and what you hear and what you feel, and see if you cave in or if the word of God is strong enough underneath you to hold you up. Amen. So in Philippians chapter, or sorry, Philemon, Philemon, it talks about, uh, I'll read this from the NIV, Philemon, um, i got to find it, <laughs> Philemon only has one chapter, so let's just go to verse 6, hallelujah, thank you Lord for this school and what you're doing through this school and through these graduates, Lord, thank you. Get yourself glory through their lives. Verse 6, it says, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you. Oh, that's verse 8, sorry. Verse 6, it says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. I pray that you would be active in sharing your faith. You know, the... <laughs> Verse, the King James says that the communication or the confession or saying of your faith would become effectual when you acknowledge every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Amen. So throughout your Christian life, you're going to have to say the things that God says about you. I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. Amen. I am who God says I am, not who my mother says I am or who the school says I am. Amen. I can I can have what God says I can have. Amen. God says I can have a full supply. Amen. I'll just, I thought of this on the break, so we'll go there. But one of the great parts of redemption is that he was, he was made sin so we could have he was made sin so we could have his righteousness amen he was made sickness so that we could have health but did but not too many people are as bold when it comes to preaching second corinthians chapter uh in second corinthians where it talks about that he this is verse 9, or chapter 9, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8. It says, God is able to make all grace abounding to you that you may have all sufficiency in every good thing. Amen. So God, God has a plan of abundance, of all sufficiency. And it's based on the simple exchange that is delineated in uh, in uh Chapter 8, verse 9, chapter 8, verse 9, it says, And we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, although he was rich, for our sake became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. Now, how many of you go around saying, I'm rich, I'm fully supplied, I'm rich, God says I'm rich, I'm fully supplied. God says that he meets all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. How many go around boldly confessing that you're rich, you're fully supplied, amen? Well, confession always precedes pr possession. I said confession always precedes possession. So if you want to receive, if you want to walk in that, you're going to have to talk about it. Okay. You're going to have to say it. Okay. You're going to have to believe it in your heart and say it with your mouth. And again, if you're, if your your faith doesn't move your mouth, it won't move your mountain. Amen. You have to begin to say, not what you have, but what you believe. And so, you know, I, I didn't come from a wealthy family. You know, my, my dad died when I was 16, 17 years old, you know, so I was on my own. You know, it, my mom said, if you want to go to college, you're going to have to pay for it yourself. You know, whatever you do in life, you're on your own, you know. So nobody was handing me any uh, help, you know, none of my uncles or uh, aunts or anyone, brothers, no one came to my rescue, okay? It was just walking with God and trusting him. But I'm glad that I've, I'm glad to have gone that route, you know, because it's better to uh, know him, amen, and be persuaded of the things that he, that he will be able to keep the things I have committed to him, just like Paul said. So I've committed to him my financial well-being, 
and he takes care of me in grand style, amen? And it's getting better and better because I'm seeing there's more and more available, you know? It's, it's not a matter of what God can do. It's about what you can believe. How much can you receive? How much can you, uh, how bold will you, you know, and not saying it one time, you know, when we talk about confession, do you just say it one time and it's done? No, you have to continue to say it. You keep the pressure of faith, okay? The, uh, uh, Kenneth Copeland used to call it the force of faith, okay? Well, you just keep your faith, your faith is always out there in the spirit realm, you know, and, and that faith will move your mountain. It will push things out of the way that are holding you back, amen? And if finances is a struggle for you, begin to boldly confess what God says about your abundance, okay? Get established in that, you know, it's part of your covenant, okay? You're in, the blessing of Abraham will come on you, through Christ Jesus, okay? The blessing of the Lord, it makes rich and it adds no sorrow with it, amen? So you, you can be well established in these things if you choose to make your mouth do what it needs to do, okay? When you begin to say you're on your way, when you begin to say you're on your way, you have to confess something. You have to say something. You have to talk the victory. Amen. Hallelujah. But let's let's look at some scriptures that support this. Um, in 1 Corinthians 15, 57, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57, hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, it says, but thanks be to God. I said, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We have the victory over sin, over sickness, over spiritual death, over poverty, over all the works of the enemy. He's handed us the victory. All we have to do is agree with him and believe, and he will move. God is my performer. I don't perform. He performs. God performs his word for me. Amen. God is my performer. Amen. He'll, he'll cause it to come to pass at last. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And let's look also at uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 2 Corinthians 2 and 14, uh, following the same theme. But thanks be to God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. My God always causes me to triumph. My God always gives me the victory. My God always, not sometimes, always causes me to triumph. Always. I always come out on the top. Amen. Because I walk with him. And he is not a man that he lies. Amen. He, he's just looking for someone to agree with him. He's just, faith puts a smile on God's faith. You know, that's what pleases him. Okay. I said, faith is what pleases him. Amen. If your faith is not talking, it's not working. If your faith is not talking, it's not working. <laughs> your voice matters. If your faith is not talking, it's not working. Amen. Faith always has a voice. Faith always has a voice. It's going to say something. It's going to be speaking. Luke 17 Luke 17 says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say. Luke, this is Luke chapter 17. I said Luke 17 and verse 5 and 6. Remember, we're emphasizing the speaking part of faith in this course, amen? Because that's where most of you are going to miss it. Luke 17, verses 5 and 6. And Luke 17, verse 5. And the apostle said, increase our faith. You know, And you come to the spirit of faith school, so you might be wanting your faith to grow, right? Well, we're telling you how to do it. Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, if you have a little bit of faith, you might say to the sycamine tree, be plucked up by the root and be planted in the sea and it will obey you. If you have a little bit of faith, you'll begin to say, and things will change. If you have a little bit of faith, you'll begin to say, amen. Your mountain needs to hear your voice, amen. I've always said this <laughs> throughout this class, your mountain needs to hear your voice, amen. So, Hebrews 11 lists a lot of the 
uh, Old Testament heroes. We've already looked at Enoch, uh, sorry, Abel, Enoch. We've looked at Noah. Today we're looking at Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, those type of people. Amen. And we'll, we'll finish up uh, tomorrow with uh, Joseph and Moses and, and others. But you'll notice in Hebrews 11, there's a phrase. It says, by faith, or the Message Bible says, by an act of faith. By faith, or by an act of faith, 20 times. So all of these people not only believed and said, but they did actions of faith. They, their faith was demonstrated in their life and in their conduct. Amen? Without a question, this message of faith, it's changed my life, amen? It's changed my life. I would not be here with you today. I'm glad that years ago when I was searching for a Bible school, you know, I looked at three, I actually looked at three different Bible schools before I went to the one that I went to, which was Rama. And I'm so glad I went there because I learned how to apply the word of God and how to have it produce results. Amen. And as, as I said yesterday, you know, faith is, faith is a lifestyle, right? The just shall live by faith, right? We saw that four times and everyone knows that if something's in the Bible once, it's important. If it's in twice, whoa, it's important, very important. If it's in there three times, wow. And if it's in, if something is in the Bible four times, it's like God is jumping up and down and saying, this is important. Pay attention to what this, what this is, because you need to know that this whole thing is about walking every day by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. And that walk of faith, those steps of faith, will produce a lifestyle of faith. So we will continually be going from glory to glory based on faith. Amen? God is the God of faith. Amen? And it's a way of life. Amen? So, you know, we're, we're looking at this. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the foundation of faith, you know, because God's word gives us a foundation on which to, uh, <laughs> a foundation on which faith can operate. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's go to the, let's go to the book of Hebrews because we're looking at the hall of fame of faith, but I just wanted to define faith for you, you know? Because, you know, in, in Hebrews 11 and verse 6, it says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. I said, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, okay? So it says, I'm highlighting the word without faith, okay? So apart from faith, separated from faith, outside of faith, or isolated from faith, it is impossible and it's unable and it's weak and without strength. You cannot please God without having a lifestyle of faith, without having a walk of faith, okay? So you're going to have to get used to not seeing <laughs> the things and, and believing things that you don't see and, and trusting in the word of God, amen, and following the spirit of God. All of these things, these, these are the fundamentals of the faith walk, you know, be led by the spirit. Speak the word of God, amen. Walk by, walk in love, amen. You know, these are the fundamentals. You know, we just do them every day. This is our lifestyle, amen. So we, we, we're, we're being positioned so that we can <laughs> bring glory to God. For without faith, it's impossible to please him, impossible. He'll never, he'll never, a part of the Moffat translation says, apart from faith, it's impossible to satisfy him. Apart from faith, it's impossible to satisfy him. Um, the Berkeley says, without faith, it's impossible to give him pleasure. I, I, again, God smiles when we walk by faith, when, we, when he sees, oh, there's my children, you know, they're, they're finally taking me at it, my word. I want to go now and define faith, you know, if we, if we want to define this faith, you know, so one way to think of it is this way, you know, faith is required. It's not optional. And I, I would say this, you know, faith is the currency of heaven. 
it's a current it's almost like a currency if you don't have anything you can't get much from god amen i mean you you can you have to have faith in what jesus did to start the relationship, to be birthed into the family, amen. Um, so he gives us grace. He 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 extends he extends his hand in grace, so that we can reach back in faith, you know. But I can say it's kind of like a currency, you know, that you 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 have to have some of it, you know. Like we're here in in Kenya, you know, they use shillings. Well, if I'm walking around in Nairobi and I've got Russian rubles, well, that's not going to help. Okay. If I have Mexican pesos, it's, I'm not going to be able to do much. Okay. So there's a, there's a currency of heaven. There's something that, that attracts or allows you to do business with God. And I would just say that faith is a currency. It, 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 it anything you need, anything you want, anything you desire from heaven, it can, you can get it by faith. Okay. Anything you need, anything you want, anything you desire. Okay. Whatsoever things, Mark 11, right? Whatever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Okay. You, you have to have an element of belief that God is willing to give it to you and that you're willing to reach up and with, with a hand of faith and take hold of that. Amen. There's no other way to please him, you know. A lot of times people approach God as beggars, okay? But believers are not beggars. I said believers are not beggars. Because God doesn't want you to beg, amen? You know, the, the, the principles of faith can be taught, but the spirit of faith must be caught, amen? We can teach you principles, but what we want you to do is catch the spirit of faith, that you are an overcomer, and you can do more than you ever dreamed before, amen? So God doesn't, God isn't moved by people's needs. You know, if God, if God was moved by needs, he'd be running all over the place, to, helping people left and right, because everybody has needs and all sorts of people around the world have all sorts of major problems. Okay. But God deals with us based on relationship. First of all, he, he has a program for the Jews, the Gentiles and the church and the church is his family. So he, the family comes first for God. Amen. But he, God doesn't doesn't want us to be beggars running around after him, begging and pleading and, and being sorrowful. Amen. God is not moved by your needs. He's moved by your faith. Amen. So don't try to get things from God by begging and don't try to get things from God by bargaining. Okay, some people want to make a, a deal with God. You know, God, if, if I do this, will you do that? You know, if, if I'm good, you know, will, now will you, if I'm good, if I, if I act right and I stop sinning, now will you do something for me? No. God owes you no blessings, okay? But all the blessings are, are bought and paid for, and they are available for free. And if you learn to take them, by grace, not based on an, an exchange, not based on your good works or your good will. Whatever you do for God, it doesn't amount to anything. You have to, by faith, receive what he's already extending to you. Amen. And we, Lord, we thank you that you give us the capacity to receive and believe that we do come behind in no good thing. Amen. Let's go to Hebrews. We're right here in Hebrews 11, but let's turn back to verse 1. And it says, now faith, this faith I'm talking about, is a substance. It is a foundation. It is a, a flooring, if you would. It is a, a something that that you can stand on and you can depend on. It's a foundation, amen. It's not. It's not. Uh, it's not a. Not something that is theoretical, but it is firm, amen. It is something that you can depend on, okay. But it's not something seen, okay. It's his word. It's his character standing on his character. It says, now faith is an assurance, the conviction, the title deed of things we hope for, believing the proof of them. We do not see them, but the conviction of their reality, faith per perceiving as real facts that are not revealed to the senses. Ooh, I like that. 
faith receiving as real things that are not revealed to the senses. This is Hebrews 11 and verse 1 from the Amplified. So what is, what is faith? You know, there's a lot of different definitions, you know, but here the word of God says faith is a foundation of things hoped for and, and, and evidence of things not seen. So d faith always deals with the unseen. So mark it down. If you're going to walk in faith, it's not going to be by sight. The faith always has to do with the unseen. Amen. So faith, uh, the Greek word is pistis. It's a firm persuasion. It's a persuasion or conviction based on hearing. Isn't that funny? That, you know, that we talk about how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing. So p your pistis, your faith, will be a persuasion or conviction that comes to you because of what you hear. You know, there's all sorts of people in this world, and I was thinking of some of my friends that are Muslims, their whole lives they've heard teaching around Muhammad and the Quran, and they are persuaded and they have a conviction, because that's all they've heard, that that is true, okay? So you can have faith in something that's false, or you can have, so, you can have faith in something that's true. The word of God, Jesus said, thy word is truth. That's John 17. Thy word is truth, amen? So God's word is the absolute gold standard of truth. So when we believe God's word, we're believing truth. We become persuaded and convicted or convinced of something that is true because we hear his word and it builds in us. Now you can hear other things and you will become persuaded and convicted that those things are true. So the enemy is always broadcasting his narrative, his lies. And what did, remember the enemy is a liar from the beginning. And he said to Eve, he said, you shall not die. He said, you know, he lied to her straight up. God said, you will die if you eat this fruit. The devil said, you won't die. So one of them is telling the truth and one of them is lying. And even today, there's people all over the world that are believing lies. They're in false religion systems. They're in systems that are trying to get to God outside of God's way, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified. There's only one way to God. It's Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. So faith simply is being persuaded of something. You're convinced of something. Okay. And so this pistis or this, um, it comes from the Greek word pioto, which is to be convinced by argument that, you know, you've heard something discussed a number of times and you, you, you begin to believe something is true and something is false. Okay. Amen. Now let's look at Isaiah chapter one, Isaiah chapter one. Thank you, Lord, for your, your word that sets us free from falsehood. Amen. Your word is truth. Don't you love the word of God? Amen. So Isaiah the great prophet Isaiah, and we'll look at chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. So God does invite you to talk to him and reason with him, okay? He says, verse 18, he says, though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Those they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. But come now, let us reason together. You know, sometimes you have to, you have to renew your mind. You have to talk things through with God until you become fully persuaded, till you're fully convinced, Amen. It's uh, this word pistis, translated faith, it, it denotes a force that is forward directed and aggressive. It's never passive and backwards reaching, but it's always going forward to obtain and achieve a specific target or goal. I'll say that again. This word pistis uh, is translated faith. It's a force that is always moving. It's forward directed, forward directed and aggressive. 
It's never passive or backwards reaching, but it's always reaching forward to obtain and achieve a particular specific goal. Amen? Hallelujah. That sounds a lot to me a lot like Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 12. You know, Jesus was speaking and he said, the kingdom of God suffers or allows for the forceful, violent ones. Amen. It says, for from the days of John the Baptist till now, the kingdom of heaven is allowing, for, is, is being moved, suffering violence from forceful people, and the violent are taking it by force. There's a, 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 a group of aggressive people that are moving this thing forward. And they're forward thinkers, and they're thinking about expanding the kingdom. They recognize that the, the business of the king requires haste, and it's time to move out in faith. Amen? And they, they're not shrinking back in unbelief. Amen? They're fully persuaded, and we're going to talk about this in a moment, uh, that, that Abraham became fully persuaded. Amen? So this pistis is the persuasion, okay? It's a persuasion. It's now faith is a persuasion. It's being fully persuaded, okay? And it is also a substance, a substance, a, a, a kind of a, I like to say it this way, a foundation that on which you can stand. It's the work, it's the Greek word, uh, hypostasis. It's a setting under, you know, something, something you can stand on, you know, and years ago, I, I took my Bible and I put it on the floor and I stood on it in the church in Ireland, in Dublin. And one of the church members got so offended because I stood on the Bible, but I, I was trying to make a point that you, if you believe the word, you can stand on the word. That's what the, God's word is a firm foundation that we can stand on. Well, that person left the church and was never came back because I had supposedly desecrated God's word by standing on it. But do you know what this Bible right here says? That faith is something you can stand on. Okay, and if if your faith is in the words of this book, then you can stand on this book. And I know I was doing it literally, and we're talking about spiritually, but this is the book is not holy. This is paper and ink, amen. But what's in it is God's the revealed will of God, and that is holy and precious. So, anyway, my mistake, <laughs> I, you know, public mistakes need public confession. <laughs> so, I don't stand on the Bible anymore, mostly because I don't want to offend anyone. I don't want people to leave a church or a Bible school because I did something uh, like that. Amen. But the Greek... He, Hypostasis is a setting under, okay? It's something that you can uh, stand on, okay? And, and I always think of the example of, of Matthew, you know, because it's, it's a word you can stand on, okay? It's not, it's not something physical you can stand on, but it's a word. It's a word of truth. It's something you can step out on, okay? And so I like this uh, example in Matthew chapter 14, you know, Jesus was walking on the water. He was walking by the disciples, okay? They were in the boat. He was on the water. This is uh, Matthew 14 and verse 28. It says, Peter answered to him, um, to him as he saw Jesus walking, he answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, invite me to come on the water to you. Invite me to come to you. And Jesus said one word, come. And, and Peter what came, out of, came down out of the ship and he walked on the water to go to Jesus. So Jesus said one word, come. And, and, and Peter was able to stand on that word, stand on that word, stand on that word. And he said, how does that apply to us, Brother Howard? Did you know that the Bible says go into all the, the world and preach the gospel? Did you know that if if you if you take that word that command of Jesus to go his commands are in, are enablements his commands are enablements so if he said you can go you can go if he said you can come you can come okay his words 
his words you can stand on. And the reason I've been going to nations for the last 20, 30 years is because I believe God told me I can go. My mother was always amazed that I went to so many nations. And I said, well, I don't know why you're surprised. I mean, God said we, to go. So his commands are enablements. His commands are the substance that we stand on. And the doors open and there's favor and there's opportunity. And the preaching of the gospel goes forth and he's glorified. Amen. It's not looking at the circumstances as, you know, as Peter looked around he saw the wind and he became afraid. He forgot that he had the command. He looked at the circumstances. You know, this is always the fight of faith, you know, that, you know, we're going to not to be moved by what we see, but only to be moved by what we believe. Amen. And if we can get to that point where we're, we just, <laughs> we have to divorce ourselves from our senses and just say, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I hear. I'm only moved by what I believe. God said I could walk on this water. So I'm going to walk on this water. Amen. I'm going to go to the nations and preach the gospel. Because Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, amen, that we should teach them, we should preach to them, we should baptize them, we should fill them with the Holy Ghost. We have a work to do. There's a harvest is great, workers are few. The Lord said that the, the laborers will receive wages, amen. All the laborers have to do is step out and they'll receive wages. They'll be paid, amen. Their way will be paid. How Hallelujah. In 1 John 5, in 1 John 5, in verse 14, 1 John 5, 14, it said, This is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. If we ask him to walk on the water and he says, Come, then faith begins where the will of God is known. If Jesus had said, Stay in the boat, then Peter couldn't step out. But Jesus said, come. Jesus said something. And it says here, if we, if we ask according to his will, if we know what he said, then we will have the things. We will have the blessings. Verse 15, for we know that he hears us and whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions for which we have asked. We know that we have the petitions for which we have asked. Amen. Hallelujah. And we're in a moment here, we'll turn to Romans 4 and look at Abraham. But Abraham became fully persuaded. You know, he, he, you talk about being f fully persuaded and having a conviction. Like he heard God speak to him enough that he finally started to believe it. Okay. Because it, it doesn't, that's why they, there's in advertising, they have what they call the rule of nine, the law of, or rule of nine, I think it's called, or law of nine, or I think it's the rule of nine. And basically that means in advertising, marketing people know this principle, that if, if a person hears something nine times, they'll believe it's true. So basically the strategy of marketers is to put a message in front of you so many times that you start to believe it's true. Like Coke is the real thing. And, you know, in the United States, there's a brand of toilet paper called Charmin. And they tell you that Charmin is softer than all other toilet paper. And of course, if it's going to be touching this part, then you want to have the softest thing you could possibly have, you know. So there's, there's all sorts of marketing out there to convince you that something is true, particularly that their product is better than any other product. And that product will make you happy. And that product will make you thin. And that product will make you young. And they go on and on to tell you things that aren't necessarily true. But if you hear it nine times, you'll believe it's true. Now, there's also an, a fact that you only remember one out of Every three times you hear it, they said that if you're not consciously focused on something, um, you, you'll, you'll only remember one out of three. So that means that for something to register on you as truth, 
you would have to hear it 27 times. And you wonder why Paul writes and says, to tell you the same thing again and again is safe for you. And it's not a problem for me. I need to tell you this over and over again until you get you until you hear it enough that you begin to believe it and it begins to change your life. You know, and that might be 27 times you need to hear these things. Maybe 27 days you need to get in the word and read the same promises, read them to yourself, uh, uh, school yourself in faith. Amen. If it takes 27 times to register that truth in your heart, you know, anyway, we have to hear the word, amen, and then we'll become fully persuaded. Now, also uh, Hebrews 11, verse 1, it says that the substance that we were just talking about, I guess uh, uh, this hypostasis, a setting under a, a confident foundation that you can step on, like Peter came out and he stepped on the command, come, amen, all right? And then the last one I want to talk about and we'll transition to uh, Abraham is faith is the substance of things or faith, the persuasion is the foundation of things and finally, this last word, hope, is the word, uh, lip, <laughs> this word, elpis, elpis, is an anticipation with pleasure, a confident expectation dealing with the unseen and with the future. It's a confident expectation and I'm going to make it very simple for you. You guys can write down all this stuff. But to me, hope, Bible hope, is a picture. And we'll see this when we look at Abraham here in a moment. You know, throughout the, the, throughout the time that God was dealing with Abraham, he was, he was attempting to paint a picture for him. He was trying to get him to see a picture, which I, what I call hope is a picture. Okay, it's an it's it's something unseen by the eye, but and it has to do with the future, not the present. Okay, it has so hope always is a picture of a desired future. Hope is a de a picture of a desired future. Okay, and what God does is He uses hope. You know, hope and faith are connected. You know, the Bible talks about uh, now now abideth faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Right? Well, faith requires hope. You know, because there has to be. I would say it this way: that hope is your target. Um, okay, hope is the picture. You know, like if you wanted to go to Paris, right? You might you might see the Eiffel Tower, and you might see the Louvre, and you might see the uh, the, the River Seine that, that runs through Paris, and the bridges over it. So you, you're painting a picture, okay? It's something. It's an, and then when you connect faith to it, it be, it becomes a confident expectation of something good. Amen. But you need a picture. You see, faith has to be focused. That's one thing I've learned. Uh, and it has to be specific. I remember uh, uh, Paul Youngi Cho, you know, he talked about the first time he believed God for something, he was believing for a bicycle. He needed a bicycle just to get around Seoul because he, he, his ministry, he couldn't, he didn't want to walk everywhere. He wanted to have a bicycle, right? This is right at the beginning of his ministry. And he said, the Lord asked him, well, what kind of bicycle do you want? What brand do you want? What color do you want? You know, and then later he was believing for a desk and he said, the Lord asked him, well, what kind of desk? What kind of material do you want? What, you know, like he had to get very specific with what he was, what the picture was that of what he was expecting. Amen. And so this is, you know, like you, you might say, well, I, I just want my hand to work. Maybe my hand doesn't work as well as it's supposed to. And so I have a picture of my hand stretching out and, and working and being flexible again. Amen. Or maybe your eyesight, you say, well, I want to be able to see 2020. Well, 
begin to envision what that would be like, you know, that I can see everything in the room. I can see the smallest print. I can see this, you know, I don't have to drive with, with glasses on, you know, whatever it is, you know, you have to have a picture of what it is that you're expecting. Amen. And that's the hope. So we, you know, the Bible talks about writing the vision, you know, that's part of it. You know, it's part of, uh, of, of, articulating to yourself, what is it that we're believing for? What do we want our church to do? What do we want our people to be? What are we expecting for our family? What are, what are our goals, you know? Like I, I'm in a church, or sorry, I'm in a church. Uh, my pastor, you know, cause everybody should have a pastor. Our pastor, every year they do a vision list. And they say every, every year, you know, write down what you're believing God for, everything that you're believing to, uh, to pay off, everything that you're believing to give, everything that you're believing to receive, you know, and, and write it down, be specific. And then every year people, they, they, they have some of those items get fulfilled, you know, cause there's no timeline with God, you know, keep it. If you, if you haven't received it this year, well, keep believing, keep, keep the force of faith. And, and we'll talk tomorrow about patience, you know, the power twins, you know, faith and patience, you know, we're going to talk about Joseph and we're going to talk about how you can bring faith and patience together and you can receive the promises of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So, I like to say that hope and f when you when you put all these things together, you know, faith is a confident expectation having to do with the unseen in the future. A joyful confident expectation that you're expecting something good. Amen. You're expecting something good. And so you get excited, you know. You can always tell if people are in faith because they they already feel like they've they have it, you know. They they're like they're so convinced. They're so convinced it's mine, you know. I have it now, you know. I've it, it, they begin to thank God. They begin to rejoice, okay? So let's Blessings and more blessings overtake me All His commandments I observe While my soul doth prosper in the knowledge Of Jesus Christ my Lord, the living Word That's what I have, that's who I am out of Abraham because of Christ I reign in life in him that's what I have that's who I am blessed have I been in the city blessed have I been in the field the Lord has commanded on me blessing it's my father's pleasure and his will that's what i have that's who i am i am a king come out of abraham because of christ i reign in life in him that's what i have that's who i am blesses everything I set my hand to My enemies run from me seven ways The Lord has opened to me His good treasure While I observe and do what Jesus says That's what I have, that's who I am I am the king, come out of Abraham Because of Christ, I reign in life In Him, that's what I have, that's who I am That's what I have, that's who I am I am a king, come out of Abraham
And I just want to review how God worked with Abraham. Amen. You know, because Abraham in Hebrew, in Romans, we'll look there in a moment, but in Romans, <coughs> Abraham is called the father of our faith. Okay. And we'll talk a lot, a lot about Abraham in, in the blood covenant class, but basically God found a man and cut a covenant with him. You know, he, he, he made a contract and agreement with a man, you know? And so you, when you have God on one side of the covenant and you got a man on the other side, the wonderful thing about covenants is as long as one of the two people is still alive, then that covenant is in effect. So here, Abraham, he died, but God is still alive. So as long as one, as long as a descendant of the original covenant uh, person is alive, then the covenant is still in force. Okay. So this original covenant that God made with Abraham is still available to us today. You know, a covenant of blessing and increase and protection. Amen. So the Lord said, this is, uh, <clears throat> I just want to point out a couple of things here. So Genesis chapter 12, in verse 1, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country and away from your family and from your father's house unto a land I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. So first of all, he puts a vision of him, him as an individual becoming a nation. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. Now he puts a vision of money and increase and prosperity. I will bless you. I'll make, you, I'll, I'll, I'll make a nation out of you. You'll have descendants. You'll have increase. You'll have blessing. I will make your name great. People will know about you. Amen. And you shall be a blessing. You shall help others. Okay. So I'm sure all these things check boxes for Abraham. You know, he was serving other gods in Haran. His, his, or his, uh, his father had served other gods. And he realized these gods are not making me any promises that they would bless me and make me a great nation. And I will bless you, verse 3, and curse, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Amen? So that's a big vision, you know? But God started speaking to him. And guess what? He didn't believe it all right away, but he believed enough to take a step of faith. And a lot of times, you know, our, we grow in our walk with God. Amen. We, 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 if God doesn't show you the end from the beginning, amen. Cause he knows if you saw what was ahead, you might shrink back and go, there's no way I could do that and not even get started, you know, but incrementally he'll, he'll lead you and he'll grow things in you and your capacity to receive will expand. Amen. So he'll grow a vision in you. Amen. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. So I just want to uh, point out a couple of references here. Also in chapter 12, verse 7, it says, The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, Unto your seed I will give this land. So he began to say, This land is where your, where, where your seed, the nation that I, I will make you a great nation. I will increase you. You will have descendants and they're going to live here. This is the place. Once he got there, God said, this is the place. This is the place. He didn't tell him that. He didn't say anything about it until he got there. You know, sometimes that's how it is with the will of God. You know, God will tell you, go into the city and it will be told you what to do. You have to go over there and then I'll give you a little bit more information about my plan and purpose. And, and I'll help you to step into all that I have uh, ordained for you. Amen. So in <clears throat> chapter 13, verses 14 through 17, it said, The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, he said, Lift up your eyes and look from this place. Look north, south, east, west, for all the land that you see I will give you. See, this is... <laughs> I said that hope is a picture. So God is painting a picture for him. Okay. Look, look everywhere. It's all yours. Look everywhere. I'm giving it to your, imagine your descendants living here. 
Okay, imagine it. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if men can number the dust of the earth, so shall your seeds be. And even arise and walk through the land. Go as far north as you want. Go as far south as you want. Go east and west. Walk all over until it gets in you what I want to do. Do you, do you believe God still does stuff like that? I do. I know God will, t he'll, he'll challenge you. He'll put things in front of you and he'll say, this is what I see. This is what I see, you know, and it's up to us to choose to believe or not. Let's look at uh, Genesis 15 verse five. It says that Jesus, or sorry, that the Lord said to Abraham, he brought him abroad. He brought him outside and he said, now look towards the heavens. He's been looking down at the earth and looking, counting sand. But now he says, look towards the heavens and count the stars. If you're able to num them, n number them, if you're able to number them, then your seed will be that number. Of course, he couldn't number them because there's an innumerable number of stars. And as far as the microscopes can power, there's still further stars out there. Amen. And notice what happened in verse six, that after God painted so many pictures for him and began to speak words of faith into him, okay, he believed the Lord and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed the Lord. Amen. He believed the Lord. Amen. He, 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 the switch of faith came on. Okay. Okay. I see it. I see it. I see it on the inside. I see it inside of me. Okay. And sometimes that's, I remember my friend that he started to, uh, he started to have an airplane for his ministry. You know, he was flying from meeting to meeting instead of driving or taking, a, and this is private aviation. So he had his own plane. And he said, well, when God first started talking about getting a plane, he, he just was like, no, planes are for other ministers, other preachers. I, I can't have a plane. You know, like the plane, he had to get the plane. He said, I had to get the plane inside of me. I had to get the wing inside of me. I had to get the other wing inside of me. I had to see myself sitting in the plane. And the plane was our ministry's plane for us to go here and to do this and do that. Amen. So sometimes it's like that. You know, you just... You know, you don't, see, you can't grab it all at once. I think that's what happened with Abraham. It's like he couldn't grab it all at once. It was, it was too much. It was an overload. You know, it's like, how could this happen? You know, how could, how could all of this? The, you know, God is so big. You know, He's got to kind of slow down, or we got to speed up. Amen. <laughs> you know, I think we need to speed up. But anyway, so Abraham, he. He's defined as, I, and let's go now to uh, Romans chapter four. And I want to read a little bit from Romans 11, or sorry, Hebrews 11, Romans four and Hebrews 11, our, all our favorite texts for this class. Amen. Thank God there's a lot of other things in the Bible, but this is so important. You know, so I'll start with Hebrews 11, <laughs> verse 8. It says, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place that afterwards he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. He went out to a place that afterwards it would be revealed to him that that was his inheritance, okay? And I remember the Lord used this scripture when I was, in, when I was looking for a Bible school I told you I looked at three different Bible schools and then I finally heard about Rama, but I'd never visited Rama. And the Lord told me, he spoke to me from this verse, exact verse. He said, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place he would afterward receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. So that exactly what happened to me is I enrolled in this school and I went, drove to that place you know, I had a, had a truck and I've put all my stuff in the truck and I drove to the place that God had called me to go. You know, I had, and afterwards I didn't, I didn't know it at the time, but I wound up living there for almost 20 years. 
I lived in that city for 20 years. So it became an inheritance for me. It became the heritage of faith, amen? And the contacts and the people that I met there, you know, God did a wonderful work because I went to the place that he called me to go, amen? By faith, amen? So Abraham did the same. He went into Canaan. And then God began to say, this is your place. I'm going to, from the north to the south, to the east, to the west, this is yours. Amen. So by faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs of the same promise. You know, but think about it. You know, Abraham was promised that he would have multiple descendants. Of course, he had a miracle son, a miracle son was birthed to him at 100 years old. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for miracle births in, in our old age. Amen. So he had a son birthed to him when he was 100 years old. And then 60 years later, when he was 160, his son, Isaac, has Jacob and Esau. Amen. Or at least or maybe 161, 162, somewhere in there, uh, those boys or the grandsons were born. So when by the end of Abraham's life, he had seen only three descendants, I, Jacob, Esau, and Isaac. Yet God had promised. So let's continue. It says here, he waited for the city which, the fa which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. By faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive, and she bore a child when she was way past age, because she judged him faithful who had been had promised. And from one man, and him as good as dead, 100 years old, was born as many as the stars of the sky in multitude, immeasurable as the sand of the seashore. And these two all died in faith, having received the promise but having seen them afar off, yet they were assured of them, they embraced them and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims upon the earth. Amen. So Abraham, <clears throat> and there's other things that it says about Abraham, but I wanted you to see that Abraham, when he died, he had not seen the fullness or the full manifestation of of how many Israelis and how many, you know, how many natural descendants he would have, the sand of the sea. And certainly he didn't see the number of spiritual descendants, which would represent the Christians. Amen. So let's go over to Romans chapter four, and let's read a little bit more about Abraham. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for the, the father of our faith, Abraham. Okay. So now we're going to see this word hope used again, you know, because hope is the thing that <clears throat> we're talking about here, this picture, you know, that God wants to put a picture inside of you, of your life. I remember sometimes that's done through a vision, okay? You know, God will give you a vision, a dream, you know, he's, he's putting something inside of you that he wants you to connect faith to, Amen make make a list of things that you know uh hope is a good waiter but a poor receiver hope hope will sit there and hope and dream and hope and see it but it takes faith to receive it you know there's two there's always both sides of that coin you know the the faith side and the hope side you know you have to have a hope which is a picture so you know what your target is you know what you're believing for but you need faith to to pull that into the out of the unseen realm into the seen realm we have to we have to grab hold of it so hope is ultimately an expectation. You know, it's like, I see it. I see, I see it. I'm expecting that. But faith is a persuasion. Faith says it's mine. I take it now. Amen. So hope is an expectation. It's a, a, a looking uh, <coughs> towards the future, an expectation of good. But faith is a persuasion, being persuaded. So you put those two together and Faith is being persuaded of something good. It's being excited about what God is doing in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, so let's read in uh, Romans chapter four. This is part of your reading assignment. So what shall we say then? 
that Abraham, our father, pertaining to the flesh, has found. Amen. And so we're, the subject is Abraham. Amen. So we're going we're gonna to drop down a little bit uh, to verse 11. It says, he received the sign of circumcision, uh, a seal of the righteousness of faith that he had being uncircumcised. And we'll talk more about that in blood covenant class. But circumcision was the uh, sign of the covenant. And all covenants have a sign. Like if you're married, you might have a ring. Okay, a ring is a sign of a covenant. It's a token of a covenant that you have with your with your spouse. Amen? Uh, so the sign of circumcision which was a seal of the righteousness, which was by faith, amen, that he might be the father of all that believed, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. So he, first, first of all, verse 11, Abraham is called the father of our faith, amen? He's the father of our faith. And one man that went to, uh, one man that had a dream of heaven or a vision of heaven, he said he saw Abraham in heaven, okay? And in heaven, Abraham is called Father Abraham. Well, we know that is true because in, I think, Matthew 15, uh, Jesus tells the story of Lazarus and Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom and he calls Abraham, Father Abraham, you know? So Father Abraham has many sons. Many sons has Father Abraham, amen? So many descendants has Father Abraham. So he's the father of us all. And verse 12, it says, the father of the circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham. The steps of the faith of our father Abraham. And I'd like to emphasize that, you know, faith is, is, is a journey, okay? It's a step-by-step -step process. You know, there was a, a movie that was uh, put out a few years ago, and it was called The Leap of Faith, okay? Well, there's no such, there's no scripture for a leap of faith, okay? We don't jump out the window in faith, okay? We take a step. And always in the leading of God, there's going to be a step for you to take. There's going to be a next step for you, okay? What, what is it that you, sometimes you have to let go of what you have? We're going to talk about Moses tomorrow, that Moses knew what to let go of so he could take hold of what God has, you know. So um, right now I'm, I'm filming in a church and the pastors are about to let go of this church, okay. They have been working here for 20 years. This is a beautiful facility. Look at the set that's here, the cameras, everything that we're using. But these pastors, they're pioneers, and pioneers have to know when to let go, what to leave behind, okay? And Moses left behind things. Abraham left behind things. He left behind Ur the Chaldees, left behind his family. You will have to leave behind things. There will be times when you will have to disconnect from something to go on to the next thing. And it's going to take faith to do that. Amen. And each one of those steps of faith are going to, you're going to have to do things by faith. You're not going to see the end result, but you're going to have to step out. Amen. And God will meet you. God will meet you at the point of your faith and your confession. Amen. So we need to walk in the steps of faith, not the leaps of faith of our father Abraham. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law are heirs, then faith is void. And the promise makes no sense. Amen. Verse 16, it said, therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. Amen. It's God's grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed and not to them only that are of the law, but also which to those which are the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Amen. So, you know, <laughs> Abraham became persuaded. He, he became persuaded of something. Okay. And he had a a substance or something to stand on, which was God's word. He became persuaded 
and convinced that God's word was true. And he, he saw something in the future. He saw, he saw something and he began convinced that that thing would be true. He had a picture. So he, his persuasion, he became fully convinced that that which God had promised would come to pass. But look at verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead and calls those things that be not as though they were. He calls those things that be not as though they were. And so this is the strange part about walking with God. You know, there'll be no physical evidence. There'll be nothing you can see, nothing you can taste, nothing you can hear that will tell you it's true. Okay, but God will call it something. And I, lo I love when Abraham, uh, the Lord changed his name. It's, it's over in uh, Genesis 17. I won't turn to it right now, but he said, and your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of, a of many nations. So imagine you're 100 years old. You're 100 years old, right? And God says, don't go by Abram anymore. Tell everyone to call you Abraham. Don't go by Abram anymore. Go by Abraham. So here's what happened is, you know, Abraham has to walk up to people and say, hello, I'm Abraham. No, I'm not Abram. I'm Abraham, father of many nations. I'm Abraham. Call me Abraham. I'm the father of many nations. Okay. Well, do you see what was happening? Every time he did that, he was confessing what God said. God said, you're the father of many nations. You're Abraham. You're the father of many nations. And so he began to uh, agree with God. He began to, every time he pronounced his new name, he was agreeing with God. Every time he had to introduce himself to one of his friends and say, don't call me Abram anymore. Call me Abraham. Every time he had to do that, he was reinforcing God's he was confessing what God said. He was agreeing with God. He was, he was holding fast to his confession of faith. Amen. So God calls those things that be not. He quickens the dead. And let's go to 18. It says, who against hope believed in hope. And there, there's really two hopes in this verse, okay? There's the hope, which I call it natural human hope or natural hope. So Natural hope is like a wish. It's a dream. It's a desire. It's a want. Okay. You're just kind of wishing and hoping and, you know, hoping and praying, you know, but not, there's no faith in it. Okay. There's, it, it hasn't become the target that your faith is going after. Okay. So it says against hope when there really was no possibility that what he was seeing would come to pass, that the impossibility he believed, he, he mixed faith, he believed in the hope, he believed that that thing that he saw would come to pass. Against hope, he believed in hope, even when, when the thing was impossible, he mixed faith with it, and it became possible, amen? That he might become the father of many nations according to as it, it was written, so shall your seed be. Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. So he didn't look at what, and he, he didn't look at his body. He looked at God. He looked at the promises. He looked at the promises. He, he did not look or consider his own body. This is a choice, which was 100 years old, or even the deadness of his wife's womb, 90-year-old woman. And he staggered not at the promise of God. So here's the two things. He could have looked at his body, or he could look at the promises. He could look at what God said, or he could look at his body. He could look at Sarah's dead womb, or he could look at the promises. He, he said, no, God said this. Oh, well, what about the doctor said that? Well, God said this. Well, the bank said this. And what, what the, the everything else is going wrong over here, uh, I'm moved by what I see, or I'm moved by what I believe. So he went back and forth, but then he, the Bible says he staggered not. He didn't go back and forth anymore. He stopped looking at those things. And that's where the switch of faith came on. And he said, he became fully persuaded. He became fully persuaded. 
He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. He began to thank God. Lord, thank you. I have descendants as the stars of the sky and as the sand of the sea. And thank you. My descendants will inherit this whole neighborhood. And I'm the father of many nations. How about that? How about someone that gets up and talks like that when nothing is happening, okay? And he became fully persuaded that he that promised was able to perform, amen? I like to, I always say that God's my performer. I, all he needs is a little bit of faith that we would just say, Lord, I, I, I agree with you. You know, <laughs> the Harold Ritter translation of faith is this, taking God at his word taking God at his word, amen? Just siding in with God, amen? Just believing what he said is true. Even when our circumstances and our senses tell us it's impossible, amen? Believing he will do what he said he would do. I like that one. Believe he will do what he said he would do. Believe his character. This is what makes God happy, you know? When we believe his character and that he would do what he said he would do. So God has a book of promises for you. He had, pro he had specific promises for Abraham for his life and his time, and he has them for you, amen? Therefore, it was imputed for him for righteousness, okay? He, 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 he received righteousness of faith, amen? And it was not written for him alone, but it is also, but for us also to whom it was imputed if we believe on him who raised Jesus from the dead and who delivered us from our offenses and raised, were raised and, and he was raised, Jesus was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. Raised again for our justification. Justified, just as if I had not done anything wrong. Jesus, Jesus was delivered up for my sins and he was raised so God can say, Harold Ritter, has, it's just like he never did anything wrong. Amen. He's the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. Okay, that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed our review of Abraham, the father of our faith. We'll see you tomorrow.